This is Seattle City Makers, and I'm your host, John Scholes. Well, I hope you're enjoying our infant podcast here. I've sure enjoyed bringing it to you and bringing conversations forward with leaders across the city of Seattle and arts and culture and the food scene and real estate and business. And today for episode five, I sit down with Dr. Vin Gupta. Vin is an affiliate assistant professor of health metrics sciences at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. He's a pulmonologist and somebody that many of us got to know over these last two years as he uh, beamed himself into our living rooms across the airwaves as a news analyst for MSNBC and NBC, lending his voice and perspective on the pandemic uh, and COVID-19, and someone who's just uh, an incredibly nice guy and with an incredibly impressive uh, resume. Uh, Did his undergrad uh, at uh, Princeton, he's got his MD from Columbia, has a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School at Harvard, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Uh, and uh, serves our country as a major in the United States Air Force uh, Reserve Medical Corps. And I sit down with Vin to talk about the politics and trust within uh, public health, uh, get a little bit um, of uh, his insights on uh, what it's been like to be on the front lines of uh, the communication around coronavirus and the pandemic throughout these uh, last two years, and ask him to get out his uh, crystal ball to uh, help us understand what the year ahead uh, may look like. So here's my conversation with Dr. Vin Gupta. Well, thanks, Dr. Gupta. I've been looking forward to this conversation because I'm not allowed to talk about COVID anymore in my household. People are tired of it. My rants and arguments and and whatnot. So I'm glad... uh, (laughs) I'm glad we get to do this and that you're making time. Uh, first of all, how how you been doing? You know, hanging in there, John. It's, it's, it's great to be here with you again. And I think the fatigue that the public feels is something that is is really visceral to everybody in healthcare. You know, unlike what some people think across the country, folks in healthcare don't like the pandemic. They haven't enjoyed it. They're looking for a reprieve. So you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not quite there yet. You've got a, a new one coming on the way here. You've got one kid at home and you're close here to number two. Yeah, two weeks away. My wife, a pediatrician, is, you know, could pop any day now. So we're getting ready. Our son, Aiden, is five. So it's sort of an interesting sense of liberation from diapers that uh, is going to go away pretty soon. So we're excited. So you, as, as I think a lot of people know, were, have been highly visible throughout the pandemic, locally, nationally, lending your voice, and I think bringing a lot of just clear, measured communication. How did you make the decision and to sort of take on that role through this pandemic to be a highly visible leader in infectious disease and sort of speaking out and sharing your thinking uh, across many, many different channels? You know, John, I, I, I don't think anybody can willfully make that decision. I felt like it was made for me to a certain degree. I I think those that go into media, public speaking, whatever you want to call it, talking about policy and are saying, you know what, I want to be the person that's always on air or I want my voice heard the loudest. I actually tend to think they get drowned out pretty quickly because it's obvious that they're not in it for authentic reasons. And so I I, I was lucky. Uh, The University of Washington gave me a platform as it made sense on issues of the day before the pandemic, whether leaning into my military role as as a reservist doc, whether it was talking about gun violence, what that actually does to the human body, climate change and its impacts on lung health. There were some antecedents here that uh, that preceded the pandemic when it came to my role in public media. And when the pandemic hit and when Seattle was ground zero, some of those relationships I built, people wanted to come back to have me talk about it. And I, I fulfill a few different roles across the public and private sector. And I was able to talk about what it's like to be at the bedside caring for a patient, what it's like to be deployed in service of our country, trying to uh, help the health systems that have been stressed anywhere from Tucson to Southern Ohio to here in Seattle, and then lean into other parts of my life that allowed for some degree of nuance, but authenticity. And I think that's what we're lacking now is, is authenticity, a genuine voice across different topics in the public domain. But when people hear it, they can identify it and they latch onto it. So to the degree to which I've had any traction with anybody listening right now, first of all, thank you for continuing to listen uh, but I think it's rooted in that. It's not seeking it out. It's having it come to you. And you've gotten a lot of praise for, I think, your measured, clear, authentic, compassionate, you know, empathetic communication. I imagine you've gotten other types of communication in your inbox and 
Facebook, Twitter feeds, and you know what's what's that been like? What what's the incoming from folks who maybe don't agree with your perspective? I, I will say it changed with uh, the administration in the White House. So when President Trump was in the White House, anything I would say that was rooted in my belief in clinical medicine or science, sometimes some people would take that to be a political statement. Often I found myself on uh, at least five different times on uh, a clip of me speaking on an NBC or an MSNBC platform was replayed back on Tucker Carlson's show on Fox or Laura Ingram's. And you know, I knew when that would happen, John, because phone lights I would, up. Phone would light up, yeah. or I would get ten or twenty emails out of nowhere, just you know, saying the worst, most awful things. And then I would say, "Well, gosh, I must have been on TV." And lo and behold, I'll call my parents in Northwest Ohio, and they say, "Hey, we just saw you." And so it's it, it it was it was interesting how basic public health messaging throughout 2020 was always you can never really navigate that space without upsetting somebody. And it was never my goal to take a a political stance. And yet especially in this climate even today, you can't say something that might be rooted in public health or clinical medicine and, and not be perceived by somebody as a critique of an elected official. I don't think President Biden, for example, has done everything right. And sometimes when I've critiqued the rollout of, for example, antiviral pills from Pfizer mm-hmm. or the monoclonal antibodies, I know many of you have actually reached out to me here in the city of Seattle saying, can I help you get therapy because you may have seen or heard me talk. And it's really hard. And I think part of that difficulty is decisions that were made proximally on availability of these drugs by the Biden administration. So blame should be shared across administrations, and yet we cannot have reasoned debate, reasoned commentary. And part of it is the media, let's be honest. When I try and leverage my platforms to get good information out there, what I find is an anchor on the other side who might be well-intentioned privately when we have that communication privately about what that segment looks like. But publicly, they're looking to take a binary approach. This is right, this is wrong. The day after Thanksgiving with the Omicron surge, the vaccines didn't work was the message we constantly got. Turns out there was nuance and that was wrong. That was the wrong message. Mm -hmm. But anxiety, fear, right or wrong, no shades of gray is what defines the media landscape. And if you're a commentator or you're a participant in that, either you try to push back on it, and if you do, you try to do so as successfully as possible. But even if you try to do that, if that's at your, if that's at your core and that's at my core, you're still going to get roped in to the black and whiteness that defines our media landscape and somebody's going to get upset. So it's something that's impossible to avoid completely. I think you accept some risk, but I view this as a, a public service, what I try to do, and, and I tolerate that risk. It seems in some ways, if you think back to the earlier part of this pandemic, when we knew very little, it was a little clear, more black and white as far as what we kind of all agreed we should or shouldn't be doing. Not everybody, right? I mean, some there are certainly some people and people in the White House, right, of, you know, that were downplaying the significance of this. But as we've gotten to know more about the virus and how it behaves and vaccines and treatments and this and that, like there is all this nuance and so much more information and a lot more, it seems like sort of disagreement and uncertainty and lack of clarity and grayness. I, mean, I just think back to those early days where you thought the thing was everywhere. It was on every surface, you know. And so you took these precautions of like, I remember, did you have like the, the gas glove in your car? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you put the gas glove on because it was, you know, on the pump at the gas station, right? You washed your boxes of Cheerios. And so there was almost like this, it was so simple because we knew so little and we assumed so much. And then it's like, now it's, we know so much or a lot more than we did. And it's, now we debate it all. What does it mean? And what should we do? And it's sort of interesting how this is. And I imagine, do you think this gets even more complicated as we kind of go forward in how we understand the, you know, the reasons we're making decisions or not? I think it does because while we have brilliant scientists and doctors at the highest levels thinking about these problems, they aren't necessarily the best communicators. In medical school, you don't go through a communications class. You're assumed to be an empathic individual who knows how to communicate at the bedside. But when we're talking about mass communication, that's not a skill set that we are given. I sought it out through a public policy degree. I focus Mm -hmm. on the art of communication. I'm still learning to this day. And yet what works at the bedside doesn't necessarily work at the podium when you're speaking to large audiences on TV. And I, and I cite this because you know, I've been thinking about what, what are the, the elements of persuasion 
in public health messaging. You know, we litigate so much unsettled science to the general public that in this notion that somehow that's transparency in real time, we're how look how truthful we're being. Mm -hmm. We're talking about all the nuances here, all the unsettled science. I don't actually think that's helpful. Right. If if we talked about all the uncertainty, all what's unsettled when it came to military affairs, political affairs, business affairs, I actually think that would heighten anxiety. Tell me what I need to worry about. Tell me what's the best decision. That's our role. That's our responsibility. And look no further than the ways in which we've talked about the vaccine. John, we've known. My public statements, just for somebody who thinks I'm, I, I might be cherry picking or, or have, engaging in revisionist history, my public statements from early 2021 are consistent with what I'm about to say, that the vaccines against a contagious respiratory virus, their only hope is to keep you out of the hospital. Mm-hmm. That's their historical barometer of success. That's why we get the flu shot. That is not the message we heard from our highest elected officials, our highest federal health appointees, which is why Omicron was viewed as such a doomsday scenario. Look at these vaccines are no longer effective. And Delta before that, right? And Delta before that. Yet if we had just nailed the messaging up front, and some of us were saying this, about what to expect, what not to expect, I think we would have had a much smoother course. The Joe Rogans of the world and others who seek to sow distrust on vaccine effectiveness probably would have had less oxygen. And then we would not be in a position that we are in now having to navigate every single scientific nuance in the public domain. Clarity, giving people your best judgment and prioritizing what you say, what you don't say. I I think that's the role of a messenger, whether it's public health or otherwise. I thought how um, Japan communicated and sort of rallied public consciousness around their three C's early on, and I think throughout this, of avoid close spaces, crowded places, and close contact settings was kind of fascinating. Of it wasn't these very specific, you know, directives, you know, around super specific behaviors, but these kind of three ways you could sort of you know, think about how you were going to behave or not. And and then you look at their, you know, per capita rate of death and much lower than any other country really. And, you know, who who knows how you can draw the correlation there, but the communication here seems so important. And do you think the public health community early on sort of fully understood maybe the lack of trust there was in this country for government, for public health, and the implications of that for everything that we have been trying to do to combat the the pandemic. I mean, did we miss sort of that kind of fundamental shortcoming and in, in the drag it would have on our ability as a country uh, to to battle this more successfully than we have relative to other places? I love that question, and, and I think it's complicated because two things were happening right now in public health. There's a chronic dynamic at play that it it trumps what science tells us and its behavior. The leading cause of of death across humanity today is smoking cigarettes. 50 years after the Surgeon General's report that cigarettes are going to kill you. Behavior. The the leading cause of of ill health, not death, ill health in the United States is obesity. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't be surprised that behavior is impacting uh, the course of this pandemic, especially in the United States. The issue on trust, and it's related to, to, to behavior, obviously trust and behavior go hand in hand. You are more likely to change your behavior if you trust the messenger. The problem was, back in February, March of 2020, things were being said from the government with our incumbent president at the time that made no sense. Here we're dealing with an airborne respiratory virus don't wear a mask. Wear our mask, we didn't plan for it. There was a sense of utter incompetence in messaging and in planning that extinguished trust in our highest officials. And then when President Biden came in, those seeds of distrust were already planted. Do I think if we had the existing administration up front during the initial days of the pandemic, would Dr. Fauci be loathed by half of the United States? I think he would probably have had a better shot at staying the test of time having a broader trust base across the United States, but that wasn't the reality. So our elected officials and the series of dominoes that they put in place early on exacerbated this dynamic of trust and behavior. And at the end of the day, behavior is what defines public health and impacts it. 
all the science in the world is not going to change that. We've known that we have such clarity when it comes to science, whether it's COVID, non-COVID issues and public health. But that's not changing anything about mm-hmm. who's dying from what, where, and how, pandemic or otherwise. The a recent Ezra Klein uh, column kind of caught my eye, and Ezra's got a little podcast of his own that you maybe have heard about, uh, Dr. Gupta. But uh, um, And com- talking about Denmark and a country with 80-plus percent of their adult population vaccinated, but also a country whose public doesn't support vaccine mandates. And in this country you're sort of in the camp of pro-vaccine, pro-mandate, pro-restriction, or anti-anti-anti. I mean, there's sort of these two yeah. you know, op- opposed camps generally, but it's sort of interesting in, in other parts of the world you know, where you've got people that are highly vaccinated, but also not fans of mandates. And I thought the one line in, this, in his column that stood out to me is, you know, you, you know what's better than a vaccine mandate, a society that doesn't need one. Yeah. And I mean, do we fully sort of appreciate the differences in kind of our culture and politics here relative to other countries and the strain that that puts on public health ability to kind of get us all sort of marching in the right direction? I mean, was that, do you think that was fully appreciated kind of at the front end of this pandemic? And like, what do, what do we do about it for the next one? Uh, no, I don't think it was fully appreciated. And, and the problem here is we all want our independent, we define freedom as the ability to say no to a COVID vaccine. And then yet the ability to consume healthcare for severe COVID two weeks later, if you so if you should so need it, right? And that's the fundamental disconnect. Somebody who says no to the COVID vaccine, in my view, as a pulmonologist, should not then be consuming or be prioritized for ICU level care and everything that that involves, all the way up to and including cardiopulmonary bypass, something that we call ECMO. That is a fundamental flaw in how we think about freedom. So you can say no to this thing that's going to keep you out of my ICU, and yet at the same time, should you need it, and 95% plus of individuals in ICUs across the country, 15,000 people dying, are unvaccinated as we speak here in the middle of February, there seems something wrong about that concept of freedom. And until we say, you know what, we're going to change the equation here, or just like we do with organs— As an example, if you drink your liver to exhaustion and you need a liver transplant, until you actually get durably listed to receive one, you have to be sober for six months, John. If you want a lung transplant because you smoked a pack a day for 50 years, you have to have quit for a certain period of time. We need, if you want ECMO or if you want dialysis because COVID's ravaged your internal organs and you said no to the vaccine, Well, that's a problem to me. We're not consistent. There's a certain sense of personal responsibility if you want something that society's paying for that's highly rationed, that costs a lot of taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. We adopt that for something like organ transplantation. I think we should adopt that same paradigm or at least have the conversation about it with experts. But what we should do when it comes to rationed care in the ICU, we can't have that debate in the public domain because it's going to be viewed as a death panel discussion, a la 2008. And yet that is a rational debate with precedence right now in our current healthcare system. Unless we have these rational deterrents, this concept of freedom is going to continue when we face the next pandemic. Maybe a leading question here, and I certainly have strong opinions on this, but do you think we've done a a good job of fully understanding and communicating, quantifying the impacts of the decisions that we've made and how we've tried to battle and manage this pandemic and, you know, mental health and physical health, uh, elective surgeries and screenings that didn't take place. You know, have we held up and shown a light on those in the ways that are important? I see what you're getting at. And and, and this is now the big debate here, which is... This is why I'm not allowed to talk about COVID at <laughs> home anymore because uh, of it, just it, the perspective on... It, the impacts, which, yeah. is, you know, in, in this country, yeah. if you talk about that, you're, you're automatically sort of thought of as somebody who's denying, you know, the reality of the pandemic and what we should be doing and masks and all of that. And that's certainly not been my perspective, but there's, it just seems like there's a lot we're missing here and huge impacts that are going to be with us for quite some time. I see what you're saying. And I think if we had March, April, 2020, then that policy landscape of lockdown, school closures, you name it, defined the last two years in its entirety then that line of thinking about cost-benefit of certain approaches, I think would make sense. 
What I can't stand though is there's some people out there today who think that we live in a world that's restricted. And I disagree with that. The, the only restriction right now that actually exists broadly across all 50 states is if you want to fly and you're not a U.S. citizen from a foreign country to the U.S., there might be a restriction on you being able to do that. Right. Outside of that, schools are not closed. Restaurants don't have limitations in terms of their capacity. Now, do you need to be vaccinated here in King County? Yeah, you do. So there are some, there's some expectation of vaccine proof depending on the zip code. But are things closed? Can you live a largely pretty darn normal life right now as we're losing 15 to 20,000 people week over week? Yeah. And so, yes, I think we have, ex- uh, I, I do not think we have done a full deep dive on the true impacts, mental health and otherwise. And yet, if you look at the restrictions that the U.S. put in place early on and then quickly let go, I think that's part of the reason why we're about to approach a million deaths. We basically said it's better for people for their mental health to have options and freedom and to open things up quickly. Florida shut down for, I think, five days, according to Open Table. Fun fact. (laughs) That decision was made. And so for those who say we live in a dystopian reality, the pandemic has defined us, public health docs like myself and others have, have tried to control individuals' lives. Well, that's nonsense. There are no restrictions right now in society. Depending on your zip code, yeah, you might have to wear a mask uh, uh, when you enter a Chuck E. Cheese all the way down to when you sit down at your table. I don't view that as a restriction. Outside of that, we've accepted that people are going to die and we've normed our current death toll here. And that the priority has not been saving people's lives. It's actually been quite the contrary. It's been allowing people to live Mm -hmm. their life largely without restriction. So Seattle's had kind of an outsized impact, as as we often do, on you know the the science, the vaccines around um, this pandemic. Do you think that's fully understood and appreciated in the city? You know, from you know your affiliations with you know at UW and IHME and the Hutch, and how would you describe to kind of the casual observer of like you know this is the role Seattle played in, in all of this, which is you know pretty significant, something we should all feel pretty. You know, proud of right? I, and maybe I, this this is just home team bias here. I don't I don't know if another city in the United States has been more influential. And I, of course, you can say I'm biased here since I live here uh, and have served in a few different roles. Have been public facing, but between the University of Washington, what the Hutch has done, what Trevor Bradford and others have done, just in in tracking variants, what our leading uh, corporate giants have done worldwide corporate giants here are headquartered. They shut down early on, beginning of March. They actually delivered the playbook, Microsoft and Amazon, on how do you best respond? You shut down. You go remote if you can. I still think that decision is so underappreciated for its significance at that moment when Absolutely. you know there were and I was a part of a lot of those conversations I'm sure, sure you were in public health of in those early days where you could go do everything else and there were events happening but yep. these employers said we're going to tell everybody to go home yep. and it was pretty profound and it was 2 decision. weeks before 2 and a half weeks before Governor Inslee said yes let's do that we were the first city hit yeah Microsoft and Amazon said go home March 5th March 7th time frame that was before New York City got hit. I mean, we were the we were ground zero. So, in addition to the fact that we were a first mover on so many of those dynamics that then defined the worldwide response, there's so much innovation happening here. There's global philanthropy through the Gates Foundation. There are leaders speaking about this publicly outside of myself that have defined how we should think about this pandemic. Chris Murray and others at mm-hmm. IHME as an example. Uh, I, I think we should all be proud to be able to live in the city and, and the role that you have played helping to really steward downtown Seattle Association. I think it's just it's been remarkable here. And yes, I agree with you. I sometimes lose an appreciation of that. Sometimes I'm like, gosh, it is so darn cloudy here. Why am I living here? And then yet you know, it takes some reflection here to realize how special this place is. Yeah, we punch above our weight and always have and certainly have over these last two years. What is your uh, crystal ball tell you for kind of what the year ahead looks like or the rest of 22 in regards to this pandemic? You know, I'm hopeful. I, I just did a stretch of nights last week uh, at Virginia Mason. And what I saw there was a stressed ICU. And uh, Seattle is unique because we're a five state catchment. What happens on Alaska, Montana, from a healthcare standpoint, impacts this city and its hospitals. And yet, the fact that we're losing 15,000 people week over week across the country is highly abnormal. Which is why I think, I know I'm, I'm sort of going on a, a brief tangent here, I'll bring it back. 
any discussions here in mid-February about what we're going to be doing March, April, May seem premature when it comes to removing school masks for kids in schools, Mm -hmm. especially if we're not vaccinating them. But come April 1st, April 1st to me, I think is going to be the watershed mark where hospitals hopefully, given rising vaccine rates, even though they're plateauing, plus some degree of natural immunity amongst those that are unvaccinated, that's going to result in relief. Between April 1st, I suspect, is going to be that watershed moment right around that time frame where you're going to see these conversations probably be much more vocal, much louder about normalcy, about removing potentially even this concept of isolating, quarantining if, 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 you, if you tested positive. Right now, it's, hey, if you tested positive, isolate for five days and wear a mask. I suspect if it's on April 1st, before long after that, it's going to be mask up, use your best judgment. Mm-hmm. And that's where we have to head if we really want to embrace endemicity. We need to stop treating a positive case as the big deal that it is currently. That paradigm will probably define the next six months, April to end of October, thereabouts. And then November, I worry about what November 22 into February 23 looks like because so many people, millions, tens of millions across the U.S. have fooled themselves into thinking that having mild symptoms from Omicron somehow gives them durable protection against COVID. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence of that. And yet many people are remaining unvaccinated thinking that they're protected. That, and I'll say there's been a a healthy number of people I've I've treated in ICUs who are two shots in, but high risk, who drag their feet on that third shot. And so it does appear that that third shot is vital for those who are high risk to keep them out of the hospital. Those combination of factors makes me worry about what twenty uh, winter of 2022 looks like. So six months of reprieve, but I do think there is a chance for a messy winter 2022 and messy winters for the foreseeable future, in part because of COVID and the ways it's changing and our underlying dynamics, which I just mentioned, plus the uncertainty of flu. We've been spared flu. But I think that's I was gonna yeah, I was gonna ask you about that. Not that we need more to worry about, but as we look ahead, not just with flu, but with some of the other, you know, respiratory illnesses that haven't circulated as widely as they normally would because of how we've been battling COVID, do we need to worry that they're gonna reappear in different in new ways and and you know, have a greater impact than norm than what a normal winter would look like? Is that something we should be mindful of? I, I think that for winter of 22, we have to be prepared for health system stress as a result of both COVID flu and even for kiddos, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV. In, w- in part, John, because for the last two years, you know, largely the behaviors that defined winter 2020 have defined this current winter, largely speaking. We haven't seen nearly as much movement, although for the holidays it did normalize a bit, but a lot of people are still wearing masks. We have a federal mask mandate on, in airports and airplanes still. There's still controls here on masking that have mitigated the impact of flu. So I do think that that's going to change. I will also say it, it was alarming to me that in, in the summer of 21, if you're a parent out there especially, I, I'm, I'm hoping you'll listen to this because in the summer of 21, Seattle Children's had a spike in their number of cases, pediatric cases, of kiddos coming in with RSV. Mm-hmm. And my wife, a pediatrician, and I were t- talking about this, and it, it sort of struck us that now, maybe as parents, or some parents at least out there, certainly some adults, don't ever want to get sick. And we've, we've normed this concept for a certain part of the, uh, at least some, uh, a certain segment of society is now saying, I don't want to get sick. And maybe if you're an adult, not a big deal. You've had years of exposure to a bunch of stuff and you have some built-in immunity. But for kids, it's dangerous. The hygiene to hypothesis- To not get sick. To, to not get sick. Yeah, yeah. The hygiene hypothesis matters to a certain degree. And the fact that we saw that spike in, in June, when we shouldn't be seeing any real spikes in respiratory viruses, they don't like hot, humid air, resulting in a bunch of kids ending up in the yeah. shoulders, that, that to me was worrisome and suggestive of the fact that we have gone over the edge in terms of what we are willing to tolerate, what we're not willing to tolerate as a population when it comes to risk. And we have to, nor- we, we have to re- re-equilibrate a bit for the health of our children. We can't vaccinate our way out of everything. We've got to get sick again. To We've some got to degree, get sick again. To avoid getting really sick is what, what I hear. Uh, to a certain degree, there's yeah. a reason. Uh, not all sickness is a bad thing. Yeah. 
you know, you mentioned your wife's a pediatrician and you know, I think every household and family has sort of struggled with how do you make decisions about what's appropriate to do and not do throughout all of this. And maybe there's some alignment and I think oftentimes maybe not and how you then how you deal with it with your extended family and holidays and all of that. Were, were you and your wife generally on the same page here? Or did you have different opinions about kind of as a family, how you went about these last two years? My, my risk tolerance was, was, was higher. If, if only because I, I really believed in the purpose of vaccination being solely to keep me out of the hospital. I think my wife as a pediatrician was a little bit more concerned about our son being the rare exception who's unvaccinated less than five being the rare exception uh, and ending up in the hospital with severe COVID. And so uh, that did impact how we decided to travel. I'd be more willing to travel than she would be. Uh, and yet I think we're probably same shade of gray, slight, slight difference here in philosophy, but believe really truly in the importance of the hygiene hypothesis as we can't guard against every threat out there with a shot. And that a part of normal child development, healthy development, is actually exposing them to the environment mm-hmm. that they're in, keeping them in school. And so I, I'm, a, uh, I'm so supportive of this concept of removing masks in school when it's safe for the health system. I don't think we're there yet. I think we'll get there by April 1st, I hope. But part of that is accepting risk. And we have, our, our definitions of it have been so skewed based on public discourse, and the ways in which that's really impacted how families and individuals think about their own risk. So we're going to debut a new segment uh, on our podcast with you, which is your perfect Seattle Saturday. What's your, what's your perfect Seattle Saturday? And I, maybe that's challenging oh, to gosh. answer now with your, you know, some yep. life transitions here with the yeah. young one at home and another one on the way here in a couple of weeks. But. <sighs> well, you know, I think it would start with uh, berry picking in Magnuson Park. We, we don't live far from, from Magnuson. We, uh, uh, of all the amazing parks in King County, Magnuson's maybe our favorite. Amazing blackberry picking, especially in the summertime. Uh, so we'd start there, followed by either a run or a bike from Burke Gilman all the way down to Fremont, and then wrap it up with uh, dinner over at Jewel, our favorite restaurant. Uh, this great Asian fusion, Korean fusion. So that's a little slice of our perfect Saturday. I love it. Well, thank you, Dr. Gupta, for uh, spending time with us and for all you've done for our community and, and communicating across our country and uh, your service at Joint Base McCord and for being a, a great doc at the UW as well. And uh, appreciate you spending time on Seattle City Makers. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Great to see you again. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Vin Gupta. And like I said in the opening, just uh, an incredibly nice human being. And I've really enjoyed getting to know him over the last year and really appreciated the perspective that he's brought through his communications uh, publicly and the empathy and grace and clarity that he approaches public health communication in the hats that he wears uh, and has worn on MSNBC and NBC and in, and in other venues where he's been a trusted voice as we've uh, grappled With this pandemic, uh, one thing we didn't talk about is Vin has played a really critical role within our region with a number of organizations in getting in front of their workforces and employees to help them better understand vaccines and take questions and talk about safety and efficacy, just encouraging people to get vaccinated in our community. He uh, spent some time with our organization back in the summer, uh, talking to our employees who had questions and uh, in the weeks in months that followed his visit with our folks, uh, our numbers went way up and now we're at 100% uh, vaccination. He did the same with the Seattle Seahawks and many other organizations, just really generous with his time and really believing in the importance of just getting in front of people, uh, understanding their fears, taking their questions, uh, and helping many in our community uh, make uh, the important decision to get vaccinated. So not something we cover, but something I wanted to mention because It's one additional way that he's been spending his uh, limited time uh, to help others within uh, our community. And since we chatted, uh, Vin and his wife, uh, welcome to uh, their family and the world, a new baby boy, uh, baby Aaron, born at the uh, end of February. So we congratulate them on that. And as I do each and every episode, I do want to close out real quickly with the must do or must see experience in downtown. And these are things that maybe have just reopened or reopened in a different way or new openings. And in this case, I've got a new speakeasy to recommend down in Pioneer Square, the Marble Room uh, down on 2nd Avenue in Pioneer Square. 
open at the end of January, open Thursday through Saturday, I think 4 to 10 p.m. And uh, it's a little back bar tucked behind the Pioneer Square DE, Pioneer Square Drinks and Eats, a, a great establishment there in Pioneer Square. The owner, Jonathan, has opened up a, uh, a new little back bar, a speakeasy called the Mar- Marble Room. So I encourage you to check that out. Open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, uh, I think four to midnight, actually. Check that out. And we thank you for joining us on this episode of Seattle City Makers brought to you by and presented by the Downtown Seattle Association with support from James Cito and production by Spark Creative. <laughs>